All right, and our recording is starting. Okay. Rabbi, it's a minute before, but it's all yours. Let's just wait till everyone gets here. I don't want to leave anyone in Egypt. No one left behind. I'm going to need myself. So. Unusual, it's mainly women. I can get him on YouTube. It'll be just him. Whatever you want to do. There we go. Okay. Okay, we'll just wait another minute or two to let everybody in. Because I don't want to leave anybody in Egypt. All right, everyone. Good evening. I'm Rabbi Feinstein, and we're delighted to be together tonight as we're preparing for Pesach. And tonight, we're going to talk a bit about the, uh, the secrets of the Seder and its deeper meanings. Um, what I'd like to do is begin with something very practical. If you go online, you'll find lots and lots of uh, tips for leading a better Seder. So I'll give you mine. And uh, these are just quick tips. We'll do this practically, and then we'll get into the the heart of tonight's conversation, but uh, far be it from me to leave out the practical part of our uh, conversation. So based on my long experience of struggling with my own family at Pesach Seders, I put this together really quickly <clears throat> so that everyone can, um, uh, can learn from my mistakes. Um, these are 10 quick tips for a better Seder. You're welcome to write these down. I put them in the chat. So you're welcome to steal these and share them. Um, my brother-in-law used to come to the Seder and be an absolute difficult person um, and, you know, just disrupt and be um, oppositional. And, and I realized that the problem was that I knew the Haggadah better than he did, and he never knew that the thing had an end. So one year I got very angry at him and I said, Ricky, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I took a kitchen timer. I set it for 40 minutes. I put it down in front of him. I said, this dings, we eat. You know what? He had a wonderful Seder because he knew that there was a time limit. So the first thing is set a time limit. It can be any amount of time you decide you want to spend. And what you do is that when the kitchen timer dings, you move to the mozi, you make mozi, you eat the maror, you get ready to eat dinner. Everyone's very happy. That way, no one thinks you're going to have to spend the whole night starving to death. That's number 10. Number nine, karpas. The word karpas means parsley. 
The fact is that the Seder wants us to have a green vegetable at the beginning for a very practical reason. The practical reason is that you're going to be doing a long discussion of a philosophical theme. You ought to have something to munch on before you get started. You're going to be hungry otherwise. That was the original reason for Karpas. So it wasn't supposed to be parsley. The only people who eat parsley are people who like Denny's, right? You're better than that. We're better than that. So instead of parsley, make a a tray. There's a really wonderful Yiddish phrase for this, crudite, right? Get uh, celery sticks and various colored peppers, uh, carrots, uh, avocado, artichokes, all kinds of good things, boiled potatoes. And then it is a tradition to dip your karpas in salt water. Anybody know why salt water? That's right. The tears of the slaves. No, wrong. It's because salt water was the cheapest salad dressing that we could afford. You can do better. Get a little good olive oil. Get a little garlic olive oil, a little basil olive oil. Make some guacamole. You live in California. So dipping carrot sticks in guacamole, dipping artichokes into olive oil, you have a wonderful thing to munch on during the course of the Seder, and everybody's happy. At the same time, when you get to that point in the Seder, because we are celebrating the beginning of springtime, Go around the table and ask everyone to talk about something new that came into their life this year. And that gives it a sort of personal spiritual springtime. Number eight, I am an ordained rabbi. I was top of my class at the Jewish Theological Seminary. So trust me when I tell you the following. Nowhere in the corpus of the entire corpus of the Jewish of Jewish tradition are you commanded to drink sickeningly sweet Concord grape wine. Yes, the Manischewitz people have a corner on the market, but you can do a lot better. My dad happens to like Manischewitz wine, so we have plenty of it in the house. But for the rest of us, put out a nice Cabernet, go get a nice Chardonnay. We like to do four cups of wine. That's what the Seder involves. So you do an aperitif, a white, a red, and a dessert wine, and everyone goes home happy. Drink good wine. Number seven, invite questions. The four questions of the Seder are only the beginning. You're invited to ask lots of questions. Make the Seder a night for exploring a major idea. Develop a question. Ask the people to bring a question to the Seder. Jewish tradition involves asking questions. We reward questions more than we reward answers. So bring questions to the Seder. That's number seven. Number six, Drink, sing all the songs, sing all the songs out loud. We like to sing Chagadia, and we, uh, we make all the animal sounds for the goat and the cat and the dog. If you've had four cups of wine, it comes out really easily. Um, we sing a verse of Dayenu for every kid at the table to say that aren't we lucky that this kid has entered our lives. So, you know, use a nice, use the songs of the Seder. And if you happen to have teenagers coming, ask them to bring music. There's lots of wonderful contemporary music about the themes of freedom and slavery, and kids would be delighted to share that with you. Number five, use a good Haggadah. Yes, I know you grew up with Maxwell House, good to the last trope, but you know, you can do better than that. There's a lot of wonderful Haggadah. VBS, I put a Haggadah together using Rabbi Shulweis's poetry at Valley Beshalom. You can find it online. There's lots of good stuff online. Lots of families make up their own Haggadah now because there is so much stuff online that you can take. There's even a website called Haggadah.org that you can just say a hundred different Haggadot. So use one that moves you. Use one that has poetry or make one up your own. Make the second night different. If you're doing two nights, make the second night something different than the first. Don't let it just be a rehearsal of the thing. Get to the second half of the Seder. We'll talk a little about that later because the second half of the Seder is all about Jewish dreams. Prepare for the Seder. That's really very important. You're going to be doing all this shopping and all this cooking and all this preparing. Take a little time to prepare the story that you'd like to tell because ultimately that's number one. The purpose of a Pesach Seder is to tell a story. We are here to tell a story about slavery and freedom, about our origins as a people, about our deepest beliefs. So tell the story. Don't forget to tell the story. That's what Pesach is really all about. Don't just read through the Haggadah, but tell a story and tell it in the language of the people who were sitting in front of you. When my kids were small, we had sock puppets, which was hysterical. Let my people go. No, no, no. And then as they got older, it became much more sophisticated. Whatever language the people are sitting in front of you, that's the language you should tell the Seder story. 
And those are my quick 10 tips for a better Seder. I put that in the chat if anybody wants. It's also going to be up on the VBS website. I think that'll help you lead a little a better Seder. Now let's take a look deeply into the philosophy and the teaching of the Pesach Seder. I want to take you to one particular year. I want to take you back 2050 years to the year 71. Now, you all know that in the year 70, 70 of the common era, 70 after the year zero, the Roman Empire, tired of ruling in a rebellious uh, Palestine, rebellious Judea, destroyed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. Well, when the temple was destroyed, the community was faced with a terrible decision. And I want you to imagine for a moment the first Passover after that destruction, Passover in the year 71, 72. And imagine the choices the rabbis of the leaders of the community had at that moment. First, there's a technical issue. The center of the Passover ritual was Korban Pesach, a sacrifice of a sheep that represented the sheep that we slaughtered in Egypt and whose blood we put across our lintel. That ritual of slaughtering the sheep and putting the blood on the lintel and then eating roast lamb on Erev Pesach, that was part of Korban Pesach, the sacrifice, that, the sacrifice of the Passover. That's what the Pesach, the Pesach is. It's the sacrifice of that lamb. Well, that was done in the Holy Temple of Jerusalem for a thousand years before the temple was destroyed in the year 70. So the rabbis had a very serious question. Now that the temple has been destroyed, and now that the sacrifices are over, now that the priests have been dispersed and the altar has been desecrated, now that the city of Jerusalem is, is off limits to the Jewish people, what's left of Passover? Can we celebrate a Passover? And, and what can we do with Passover if we can't offer the sacrifice, which is, after all, the very core of the tradition? But there was a deeper question, not just a technical question, but an ideological question, a philosophical question, even an existential question. The Temple of Jerusalem was the center of Jewish life. No matter where you lived in the Mediterranean, where you lived in the world, you faced the temple when you prayed. People made pilgrimage to the temple. It was a belief of the people of Israel that God lived in that temple, that there was somehow the presence of divinity in that temple. In the middle of the Holy Temple of Jerusalem was a room called the Holy of Holies, Kodesh HaKodeshim, the inner sanctum. Nobody ever went into that room because it was believed that God, that divinity was somehow present in that room. The only person who ever went into that room was the high priest on Yom Kippur. The high priest would spend a month preparing to enter that room, a month in meditation and prayer and preparation so that his thoughts were pure and he could concentrate with all of his might on the welfare of his people and the welfare of his land and go and pray for the people of Israel. And he would go into that room in a cloud of incense to protect him. But just before that high priest entered that room on Yom Kippur to offer those prayers, just before that rite began, they tied a rope around his leg. In case the poor guy died in the middle of the ritual, nobody else would have to risk their life going in there. They could pull him out by the rope. That's how palpable, that's how tangible the presence of God was for that community in that room. And one afternoon in the middle of the summer of the year 70, the temple is destroyed. That room is destroyed. God, as it were, is banished from the world. The Jewish people loses its core, its central institution. They lose their priests, they lose the altar, they lose the sacrifices, which was the, the principal way that Jews worship. All of a sudden, it's all gone. So you can imagine the first Passover that followed that destruction, there was a serious existential question. How can we sit and tell a story how can we sit and recite the words talking about a God in history, a God who redeems God's people, a God who would send plagues to destroy an evil Pharaoh, a God who would carry us across the Red Sea? How can we speak about a God of history, a God who redeems in the dark shadow 
of the destruction of that holy temple. And I suspect that the questions that the community was asking that spring were the kinds of questions that our generation and the last generation have asked in the shadow of the Holocaust. Has God abandoned us? Is the Jewish project in the world over? Is there any sense in which God has purposes in human history? Is there any sense in hoping for redemption? After all, God sent plagues to destroy the Pharaoh. Why didn't God send plagues to destroy the Romans? God redeemed us and brought us across the Red Sea. Why didn't God save God's temple? How do you understand that abandonment? How do we understand that deep sense of sadness? Is there any hope? That's the question. Is there any hope? And the rabbis of the year 71, 72, 2050 years ago, as they faced the coming Passover, they had to make a decision, a determination. Do we simply give up on Pesach? Do we simply give up on the holiday? What can we make of the holiday now that this is the situation in which we find ourselves? And they made a decision. They made a decision to give us Passover, but a different kind of Passover a Passover that would be celebrated in a different way with a different language and a different ideology. And they left us notes. And the notes I want to share with you today is a chapter from the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is the code of Jewish law that was codified and written down in the year 200. That is about 120 years, 130 years after the destruction. And in the, the, the Mishnah of Psachim, the Mishnah of Passover law, deals mainly with how you clean chumets out of your house and mainly with the sacrifice that was once offered in the temple. But the last chapter, the last chapter of Psachim, of Mishnah Psachim, chapter 10, is an account of how one does a Seder. It is really the law of the Seder that we observe today. And it's an unusual chapter, and I'll show it to you in a moment, but let me pre preview it by telling you that it's unusual because usually Mishnah law is very, very, very terse. Mishnah law assumes that you're already leading a Jewish life and you know how to do it. And they're just going to tell you how not to make mistakes. I'll give you an example. At the beginning of, um, at the, beginning of the first Mishnah you learn as a kid in school with Meimatai Korimit Kriya Shema. What, we know, what time do you, are you allowed to say the Shema in the evening and how late can you say the Shema? Now think about that. There's no Mishnah that says you have to say the Shema. You know that already. There's no Mishnah that says that this is what's in the Shema. You know that too. The only question is, what time do you say it and what time do you have to stop saying it? Mishnah Sukkot, for example, starts by saying, these are all the Sukkot that are treif. They are not kosher. They assume you know you're supposed to build a Sukkah. They assume you have some idea what a Sukkah is. They assume you know why you're building a Sukkah. The question that Mishnah Sukkah is dealing with is, you know, how, how big is a sukkah that's not a kosher sukkah? How small is a sukkah that's not a kosher? What are the limits? You ever, you ever see Japanese painting? You know, Japanese masters are able to create a whole scene, a whole picture using just a few lines because they count on your mind to fill in the, the, the empty spaces. And that's what the Mishnah does. But this Mishnah is different. This Mishnah is not terse. This Mishnah is not... Um, does not assume, you know, it goes carefully chronologically through the Seder, telling us how to do a Seder. And I want to suggest to you that what this is, is a remarkable document. It is a document which sets out our Seder because the rabbis understood that the purpose of Passover and the purpose of the Seder is to rekindle hope, to rekindle hope hope. That's what the Seder is all about. So let's take a look together at what it means to rekindle hope. Shall we? Here is Mishnah Psachim. Everybody see that okay? So Mishnah Psachim, it begins with the following idea. On the eve of Passover, one must not eat from the time of Mincha till dark. So remember, in, in Mediterranean cultures, even today, even today in Mediterranean cultures, um, people eat their big meal in the afternoon. But they're, what they're telling you is that on Erev Pesach, on Friday, which is Erev Pesach, of course, 
um, don't eat a big meal in the afternoon because we're going to have a feast in the evening, right? Even a poor person doesn't eat in the afternoon and they give him not less than four cups of wine, even if it comes from the charity food. Now, let's stop for just a second and take a look at this. Pesach is all about the Pesach sacrifice and it's all about matzah and maror. Nowhere in the Bible does it say anything about wine. Where does wine come from? Why wine? And why four cups of wine? That's a lot of wine. Why wine? Because wine is a symbol of joy. And that's what the rabbis are going to put into the Seder that wasn't there before. They're going to interject wine because they want to make this a holiday, not just about philosophical redemption. They want to make this a holiday about celebration, about joy. And they're dealing with a people that is deeply disillusioned, deeply dispirited, deeply despairing. And they want to give us back the joy. You'll take a look and we'll go down just a little bit. I'm going to skip down just a little teeny bit, right? The first cup is filled. Now you'll notice, by the way, in your Seder that there are four cups of wine and the four cups of wine are the geographical markers of where you are in the Seder. The first cup is the cup of sanctification of Kiddush that sanctifies the day. We start the Seder with the first cup. Then we tell the story of the Exodus. Oops. We tell the story of the Exodus over the, um, the second cup, okay? And the third cup, the third cup comes and the third cup, and, and we, we finish that second cup, we say the blessing over redemption. The third cup we eat dinner with, it's the dinner cup, basically. And when we finish dinner, we make the, the, the grace after the meal, the birkat amazon over the third cup. It's the cup of gratitude. And the fourth cup is at the very end of the Seder. It's a cup of hope, of sanctification, of redemption, of gratitude, and hope. Those are the four moments of the Seder. And the rabbis are the ones who institute this. This is not in the Bible. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. But there's a little controversy here. And here's the controversy, right? When they fill the first cup, when they fill the first cup, the school of Shammai says he recites the benediction over the day. And then he recites the benediction over the wine. And the school of Hillel says, no, it's the other way around. He recites the benediction over the wine. And then he recites the benediction over the day. Now, what is he talking about? If you've ever done Kiddush for Shabbos, it's the same thing. Kiddush on Shabbos and Kiddush on Yontif has two blessings. One blessing is Bori Priya Gafen. It's about the wine. The second blessing on Shabbos is Mekadesh HaShabbat, God who sanctifies the Sabbath. And the sec on Yontif, it's Mekadesh Yisrael Vahazmanim. It's the cup of sanctifying the day. So the question is, which one has priority? Which one goes first? Well, think for a moment. Shammai is right. I mean, the reason we're here is because it's a holiday. We should do the blessing over the holiday first, and then we get to the wine. But Hillel understood something about the moment. And the rabbis who embraced Beit Hillel understood something about the moment. This was a moment of deep sadness and dispirited, uh, dispirited despair among the people of Israel. You can't bring God into the room. You can't sanctify this day if we're all filled with the sadness of destruction and the hopelessness of a history that seems so dark. So the first thing we have to do is welcome joy into the room. And joy has to be done as a mitzvah. So you need a bracha to do it, to remind us that joy has to be engaged in. We have to choose joy. And that's why we begin with a wine blessing and then go to the sanctification of the day. If you will, Shammai is logically right that the day should precede the wine. But Hillel is psychologically right that you can't have a day of sanctity. You can't have a moment of sanctification. You can't have a moment when God feels close if you're feeling despair over the way that the world is looking. And, and this has been a great Jewish vision, you know, because we've lived through some very, 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 very painful moments. And yet this is a people that has always found the capacity to embrace joy. Think about that, that joy is a mitzvah. 
was Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav, the great Hasidic master of the third generation, who said it is a, the highest mitzvah of the Torah is to cultivate joy. Because where sadness lives, God can enter. Only in the cultivation of joy. And cultivation of joy is sort of an opposite idea because it, it's not that joy just happens. You've got to like set your mind on it. Only in the cultivation of joy can you bring divinity into the room. So the first thing we do is we put the wine on the table. We make the bracha over the wine and then the bracha over the day. But I want to stop a second. We missed something. We miss something because it's so obvious to we who are Jewish. We miss something because it's so easy for us to overlook it because it's so simple. Where is Pesach happening? For a thousand years, Pesach happened at the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. But now that the temple is destroyed, what did the rabbis tell us to do? Bring it home. Bring it home. Now, first of all, where did they get that idea? I'm going to show you where they got that idea. They got it from the Torah. It's actually what God told Moses in the beginning. This is Exodus chapter 12. This is the chapter where the first Pesach is described. And the, the wonderful thing about this chapter is it's given right before the 10th plague. Like before the story ends, I'm going to tell you how to remember this. Right. Imagine Thomas Jefferson gathers the Continental Congress before they sign the Declaration of Independence on July 4th. And he says, boys, from now on, here's how we're going to remember the 4th of July. This is before the 10th plague. God says to Moshe, speak to the people of Israel and say to them that on the 10th of the month, each of them shall take a lamb to a family, a lamb to a household. If you don't have enough people in your house, share the lamb. Right. On the 14th day, you're to slaughter the lamb, paint your doorposts with the blood. And that way. The angel of destruction won't touch you. Then you'll eat the flesh that same night. You'll cook it over fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Eat it quickly with your loins goited, girded, sorry, goited, girded, your, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. It is the Passover offering. What does Moshe tell people to do? Eat the Pesach at home. Later, it became a sacrifice in the temple. But the original intention was that it was a meal to be eaten at home. And so when the rabbis experienced the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, what they did is not invent something new. They actually went back to the way that this was meant to be before at home. It's a home ritual to be eaten as a meal, a home ritual around a meal, it's a typically Jewish thing to do, you know? You're going to celebrate the most important moment in the history of our people over supper. Now, again, I want, to, I want to notice this because it's not obvious. It is such a profound point of view. Let me try to describe this for you. In 1990, the Dalai Lama, who is the leader of Tibetan Buddhism, invited a group of Jewish scholars and teachers to his estate in Dar es Salaam, India, where he lives in exile, to ask them this question. We Tibetan Buddhists are in exile from our homeland, and we are worried about preserving our faith and culture. You Jews have been in exile for 2,000 years. How did you do it? What is the secret of surviving in diaspora? How do you keep a religious culture alive in the diaspora, separated from your land, separated from the physical markers of your culture, separated from an environment in which you, everyone shares, separated from your language. How do you keep a religious culture alive in diaspora? And the, and the scholar, it's a beautiful book about this called The Jew and the Lotus. And the scholars presented him all sorts of ideas, the study of Torah and the practice of tzedakah and the power of a Jewish community. But the idea that caught the imagination of the Dalai Lama came from the wonderful scholar, the writer and poet, Blue Greenberg. And she said, your holiness, the answer to Jewish survival is the Jewish home. He was taken with this because in Buddhism, there's no such thing as a home. There's no such thing as a Buddhist home. But the idea that home is the locus of religious culture, the home is the place where religious ideology is shared, the home is where religious values are given, the home is where we meet God, that domesticity is related to spirituality. 
Because in many cultures, it's the opposite. In many cultures, domesticity and spirituality are opposite each other. Think about the Catholic tradition, the beautiful religious tradition, a powerful religious tradition. Why, are the, why is the priest celibate? Because he has to be father to all. Domesticity and spirituality are opposite. You have to separate. In the New Testament, Jesus takes his disciples away from their families in order to follow him. Domesticity, home life, and spirituality are separate from each other. But in Jewish life, and we've all become so used to this, we don't even notice it. The Seder takes place at home. Your family is sitting with you. Your friends, your chavarah is sitting with you at the kitchen table, the dining room table. That's where you meet God. That's where you meet the truth of your faith. And so the Seder is taking place at home. And the rabbis are taking this idea from the original mitzvah, which said, take the sheep and slaughter the sheep and, and cook it, roast it, and serve it with unleavened bread and matzah. Unleavened bread, matzah, and with maror, with bitter herbs. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? Pesach, the sacrifice, or the, the sheep, matzah, and maror. Pesach, matzah, maror. Those are going to be the three principal symbols of the holiday. And what's going to happen is in the Torah and in the post-biblical tradition, Pesach goes from a meal at the table to a sacrifice in the temple. But what the rabbis are going to do is return it back to the table. They're going to return it back to the table. And it's going to become dinner. And it's going to represent symbolically the sacrifice that was offered, but it's not going to be the sacrifice. It's going to be the, the roast lamb that you ate. And for a thousand years, Jews ate roast lamb at Pesach. Now, a thousand years ago, they changed the menu. They changed the menu to brisket, or turkey, or chicken, or God knows, tofu, God knows what else. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. But for the original Seder, the menu was Pesach Matzah Maror. Let's take a look at what the Mishnah teaches us now. Ready? When they brought before him greens, he dips them until he, he dips them. So every, every Roman meal, every, every Mediterranean meal began with greens dipped in some sort of salt water, dipped in some kind of dressing. And then until he reaches the breaking of the bread. And then they brought before him unleavened bread, lettuce, haroset, and two cooked dishes. Although haroset may or may not be a mitzvah. And when the temple existed, they brought him the meat of the Passover offering. Now, it's interesting the way the Mishnah puts it. You know, this is the way you do it in the temple, but it's the same ritual. But it's not the same ritual because you're cooking the lamb now, not the priest of the temple. So what are they talking about? Well, here's what it is. Anybody have a Seder plate? If, uh, if you got married in a Jewish ceremony, you have 10 of them, right? So I have like, you know. A Seder plate, you know, the Seder plate is that beautiful plate and, and on it you have the little dishes and you put all the things, you put a bone and an egg and, a, and, a, and the carpas, the greens and the, and the horseradish, the, the chrein or the, or the, the maror and then the haroset. You know what to say, everyone got a Seder plate, right? Well, here's the thing. In the original Seder, the Seder plate was not a plate for symbolic foods. The Seder plate was dinner. Anyone ever eaten in an Arabic restaurant or a Moroccan restaurant or a Persian restaurant? How do you eat the meal? First of all, where do you sit? There's no tables or little tables maybe, but there's no like table table and there's no chairs. You sit on a rug on the floor on pillows and you lean and you're going to eat slowly. You see, because slaves have to eat quickly. They don't have a lot of food, first of all, and they got to eat quick. But, you know, now that we're people of freedom and leisure, we can lean and we can eat leisurely. And how does the meal get served? Well, a lady with a remarkably lovely belly button comes into the room with a hammered copper tray. And on the tray is a mound of grain. If you're in a, a Moroccan restaurant, it's couscous. And if you're in a... Uh, uh, Arabic or Persian restaurant, it's rice. And on top of the grain is the meat that you ordered so that the juices of the meat go through the grain. And around the sides are the, are the condiments that you're going to dip this in, right? Now, how do you eat this mess? There's no knife and fork, maybe a knife, but there's no knife and fork. This is not the way they eat. What they eat is they pick up a piece of bread. 
in an Arabic restaurant, it's pita. In a Persian restaurant, it's lavash. And in a Moroccan restaurant, it's sort of a piece of baguette. And you take some of the meat and some of the grain and you dip it in the condiment and you use the bread as a scooper and you eat. Well, what happens here? What the Mishnah is describing is they bring him the dinner. And what's on the dinner plate tonight? What is the dinner plate? Well, it's your Seder plate, only it's dinner, right? This is what they bring him. They bring him unleavened bread, lettuce, which is karpas, that's your green vegetable, haroset, I'm sorry, lettuce, lettuce here is not lettuce. The lettuce here is a bitter lettuce. It's a bit, this is maror. This is the bitter lettuce. They didn't use horseradish. That's an Eastern European invention. They used a bitter lettuce. Um, someday, as the as a, a California Jew, Jewry will evolve, we will end up using um, either uh, wasabi or jalapenos. I'm quite convinced of this, right? Haroset, which is a sweet paste, right? And two cooked dishes. The two cooked dishes are, well, on your Seder plate, it's the bone and the egg. The bone is the Pesach sacrifice, the Pesach meal. It's the roast lamb. And the egg represents the Chagiga, which was the generic holiday offering. And then there's a question about whether Haroset is a mitzvah. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. I like Eliezer Ben Sado because his Haroset is a mitzvah. And when the temple was there, instead of bringing him the, one of those cooked dishes, it was, the, uh, it was the sacrifice, right? That's dinner. Now, what's, what's going to happen? What, what's going to happen when we start trying to eat this thing? Um, anyone ever try to eat with matzah? Anyone ever try to eat with? Now, early matzah, by the way, was probably not the kind of matzah we get at the market. It's probably not this flat crackery thing from Streitz or Manischewitz or Horowitz Margaretin. It was probably closer to a tortilla because you really couldn't eat any of this with a matzah. But so is it, you know, so the kid sees that you're eating matzah, right? And the kid says, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait where's the pita? Why the flat bread? And the kid sees this bitter vegetable and says, wow, 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 what, what's with the bitter vegetable? And the kid sees the roast meat and says, why this meat? And the kid sees what we're doing tonight. And the kid asks the question. Now, this is wonderful. I want to show you one thing. Before we go back to the mission, I want to go back to the Bible for a minute. Watch what happens in the Bible with me, okay? So remember, God says to Moshe, buy a lamb, bring it home. Slaughter on the night of the 14th, that's Friday. Paint your doorposts. I'm going to go through the land that night and bring the 10th plague. So Moses gives the people this law. Moses summoned the elders. This is chapter 12 of Exodus. And he says, go pick out a lamb for your families. Take the hyssop, dip it in the blood, apply it to some of the blood that's in the basin to the doorpost. Don't go outside. Dangerous out there, right? For when the Lord goes through the land to smite the Egyptians, he'll see the blood on the lintel, the two doorposts, and God will pass over and not let the destroyer enter and smite your home. You shall observe this institution for all time. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel, relating God's commandment. But he adds something. Moshe does Midrash. Moshe adds an interpretive note that God didn't say. Because Moses says, you'll observe this for all time. God told him that for you and your descendants. And when you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he's promised, you will observe this right. So the question is, is this right just for this one night, the night we're leaving Egypt? No, you're going to do it every year. And when the children ask you, what do you mean by this right? Mazelachem. Anyone recognize that question? Mazelachem. That's the question of the wicked child, actually, but not in its original context. Four times in the Bible, Moses is going to say to the people, when you do this, your kid's going to ask you, why are you doing it? And this is what I want you to tell him. I want you to tell him it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord because he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and he saved our house. He saved our homes, houses. Moses adds that. And it's interesting because God said, do it because it'll save your life. Moses says, I want you to do this, not just to save you this year, but I want you to do this every year so that you will remember how we came out of Egypt. So you'll remember what we did. So you'll know this story. So this narrative will be part of your being in the world. 
And he uses this idea of when your kid asks you the question, you'll tell him. Now, he could have just told him, do it, and here's why. But he doesn't use it. He says, when your kid asks you the question, you'll give him the answer. So the Seder, the rabbis of the Mishnah, they pick up on that idea, on that, that structure, that the meaning of the Seder is conveyed in answer to a child's question. But it's deeper than that. I want to tell you that it's deeper than that. I hope that all of you know my dear, dear friend, Herschel Fox, who is the cantor at Valley Beth Shalom, been cantor for many, many years, and he's a sweet, dear friend. Herschel was born in Poland right after the war. His parents, as the Nazis were arriving in their, in their Polish village, took off to the east and hid in Russia. And after the war, they slowly came back. Eventually, they made their way to Winnipeg, Canada. And that's where Herschel grew up. I asked Herschel this question. How old were you when you were a little kid? Do you remember anything? He didn't remember. I said, did they do Pesach? When you were a little kid, did you do Pesach? He said, I don't remember Europe, but I remember Winnipeg. Herschel said they, he lived in a community of survivors. Almost everyone was a survivor. And I said, did they do Pesach in Winnipeg? And he, he looked at me, he said, told me a very wonderful story. He said, absolutely. It was very important. It was very important. He said to me, but when they did the Pesach, they cried through the whole Seder. They cried through the whole Seder. Now, just think about this. I, mean, it's the, I think it's the closest analogy to that first Seder in the year 71 that I could think of. People whose eyes saw what human eyes should never see and whose ears heard what human ears should never hear and who lost everything, who lost family, who lost friends, who lost homes, who lost everything that was theirs and schlepped across, they survived somehow and schlepped across the ocean and ended up in, a, in the Galut, in the diaspora of Winnipeg, Canada, of all places. And I said to him, where did they get the strength to tell the story of the Seder? And Herschel said, they looked at us, the children. It was because of the children at the table that they found the hope to tell the Pesach story. That's why the rabbis put it that way. First, be out of imitation of what the Torah says, because your kid's going to ask you the question, answer the question. And then more than that, because by pointing to the children at the table and by giving the children a voice at the table, by making them visible and audible at the table, we were saying, we are not dead yet. We will live and not die. Our culture is not dead. Our hope is not dead because the children at the table and the children are asking us who we are and where we come from and why we're doing this. And that's why children are so important at the Seder. And so the Mishnah tells us what? The child asks the question. And if the kid can't do it, the father just tells him or the parents just tell him. Now, it begins with Manishtana Halayla Hazeh, which I'm going to suggest to you is a very strange question because it's, that's the question. But I think it's a very much deeper question than we usually give it credit for. Remember, this is 71, the temple's been destroyed, or this is 1945, the Holocaust is over, 1946. We survived the destruction. Why is tonight different? Where did we get the strength to find hope tonight in, the, in a shadow of destruction? Where do we find the strength to say yes to life and no to death? And then the kid asks us these questions, right? On all other nights, this is the Mishnah's version of the Manishtan, a little different than ours. On all other nights, we eat leaven and unleavened bread. This night, only unleavened bread. So matzah is the first question. The second question is, on all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. Tonight, we eat bitter herb. Maror. Matzah. Maror. And all other nights, we eat meat, which is roasted and cooked or boiled. Only tonight, only roasted meat. Pesach. Now, so in, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, it's Pesach, matzah, maror. But when the kid asks the question, it's matzah, maror, Pesach. Everybody see that? And the question assumes that matzah and maror are equivalent to the Pesach. In the Bible, the Pesach, the sacrifice, is the principal ritual, and you eat it with side dishes of matzah and maror. But when the kid asks the question, 
It goes the other way around. And in the original question, by the way, those are the three questions. Or the, actually, the bitter herb question is in there, just the dipping question, because that's also about maror. Right? That's also about maror. So the kid asks the questions. Pesach matzah maror. And what's the answer? Well, the answer is going to come a little bit later in the Seder when Rabbi Gamliel is going to tell us that there are three things you have to explain at the Seder. Pesach, matzah, maror. But when Rabbi Gamliel tells us Pesach, matzah, maror, Pe Rose Rabbi Gamliel, he's the leader of the Jewish community in that generation since the destruction, in the, after the destruction. He equates the three. So that even if we don't have the sacrifice that is Pesach, all we have is roast lamb to remember it, that's enough. Because we have the matzah and maror, and we have the gathering around the table, and we have a child's question, and we have the telling of the story, and even without the temple, that's enough. Except it isn't enough, because the temple is gone, because we're exiled from our land because we're living in a broken world. And, you know, this year, as last year and the year before, we're, we're even with all of the blessings and gifts that we have, living in a democracy like America, which accepts and welcomes and protects us. This year, when we think about brothers and sisters and men and women suffering in the Ukraine, when we think about people that are victims of this COVID, when we think about the, the, the murders, the terrorist murders in Israel, we, we say to ourselves, how are we going to talk about a God of Israel? How are we going to talk about a God of history? How are we going to talk about miracles and redemption? How are we going to tell a story of hope? And that's why there is this really curious, weird song right at the end of the telling. And what's the curious, weird song? Ilu hotzi hotzi anu, hotzi anu me Mitzrayim, hotzi anu me Mitzrayim dayenu, dayenu. It would have been enough. What a wonderful idea. Yes, I want there to be a full redemption of the world. I want to see the process of the exodus happen all over again and bring us redemption. But until that happens... I'm going to still count up the miracles that I have experienced, the miracles of Exodus from Egypt and crossing of the sea and Mount Sinai and the miracles of the recreation of the state of Israel and the miracles of the, the birth of a liberal democracy that welcomes Jews here and around the world and the miracles of Jewish existence that go on even after the Shoah. I'm going to count up each of those miracles. And yes, I know that the world is still mightily unredeemed. And yet I'm not going to let that keep me from stopping for a moment to celebrate Dayenu, look at the miracles we have experienced. And that's the deeper meaning of Dayenu. If this is a night of hope, and this is a night to assert that we have been the beneficiaries, the recipients of miracles, let's at least recognize them. The Talmud has a wonderful observation. The Talmud sort of shakes his head and says, Ein balanes makir beniso. People who experience miracles never see them. It's only in retrospect that you can see a miracle. And the Seder is trying to tell us, no, don't be that person. Recognize the miracles that are yours, even if the world isn't finished yet. Even if the process of redemption isn't finished yet. And then what's the last thing we're going to do in this part of the Seder? The last thing we're going to do is say a bracha. And there's this beautiful, beautiful controversy. There's very little controversy in Mishnah Psachim, chapter 10. Very little controversy. But there is this one controversy. And the one controversy is, what bracha do you say? What is the blessing that you say over the second cup of wine when you finish telling the story? Rabbi Tarfun, who's this great rabbi of the third generation of the Tanaim, Rabbi Tarfun says the blessing is God who has redeemed us and redeemed our ancestors from Egypt and brought us to this night to eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs. All right, that's a nice blessing. But Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Akiba went farther and said, no, no, my brother, we have to go farther than that. And he adds, therefore, Lord our God and God of our ancestors, 
Bring us in peace to other feasts and festivals. We rejoice in the building of your city and celebrate in your service. And may we eat there of your sacrifices of the Pesach, whose blood has reached the favor of your altar. And let us praise you for redemption. Baruch atah Adonai Goel Yisrael. Do you say the blessing in the past tense or the blessing in the present tense? Rabbi Tarfon says it's a blessing on what happened to us. Gaal Yisrael, it's in the past tense. And Rabbi Akiba says, no, my brother, we have to say a blessing in the present tense, a God who is not finished with the process of redemption. And that is the opinion that takes the day in the Seder. And so the second half of our Seder, the second half of our Seder is going to be all about the redemption that's yet to come. All about the redemption that's yet to come. I know I have to confess to you, and this is personal, so I apologize, but I was 17 years old before I realized that there was a second half to Seder. In my house, my father and uncles would unbutton their belts, compliment my mother on her cooking, and fall asleep, leaving us kids to finish the cherry Manashevitz wine and have our little fun. But then we one year we opened up to the end of the Seder, and you know what's at the end of the Seder? Pure messianic hope. First of all, you're going to open the door to Elianovi, right? Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, who is the, the announcer of the Messiah's arrival. Think about that. You're welcoming redemption into my house, right? And then we're going to sing all those wonderful songs, right? Adir Hu, Adir Hu, Yivne Beitoi Bekarov. May the great power of God rebuild the temple. And the last one, the song that's my favorite in my family, which is the funniest, goofiest song. It's the Jewish version of I, I Know an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly, right? Chad God Ya, Chad God Ya, meh. A father who buys his kid a goat with two zoos. That's before inflation took hold. This year it'd be 10 zoos. And the dog, the cat eats the goat, tough neighborhood. And the dog bites the cat. And the stick, stick hits the dog and the fire burns the stick and the water puts out the fire and the ox drinks the water and the shaykhid comes and takes down the ox and the malchamavis, the angel of death, comes and takes down the shaykhid. And what's the last verse of Chagadia, the last verse of the last song of our Seder? Ve'ata kodesh baruch hu v'shachad lemalchamavis comes God and destroys death. God destroys death. That's the last word of the Seder. Then you say, Lashana Hababi Yerushalayim, and then you go to sleep. But the idea that the, the Seder ends with pure hope, with Jewish dreams of a world without death, of a liberation from the ultimate slavery, the slavery of our own mortality, that's the great hope at the end. So it begins with Pesach La'avar, Pesach that was, and it ends with Pesach La'atid, with Pesach that will yet be. I would submit to you that the Seder is a technology for the creation and preservation and cultivation of Jewish hope. And hope is what makes us a people. You can give up kashrus. I'm not recommending you do, but if you have to, you have to. And you give up Shabbos and you don't want to come to shul because you don't enjoy it. I get it. But don't give up hope. To give up hope is to give up what we are. And the Pesach Seder is all about hope. We crossed the Red Sea, all of us together. We stood on the other side. We looked back and Pharaoh wasn't chasing us no more. And then we turned around and looked out at the vast openness of the wilderness and we breathed as free people for the first time. We were slaves. Our parents were slaves. Their parents were slaves. We had no hope except to be slaves and our children would be slaves. Maybe they would have it a little easier than we did, but they'd be slaves too. We had nothing. And suddenly we find ourselves free. We had hope. And that is the cultivation, that mentality, that sensibility, that way of thinking about the world. I'm not done with history, says God. You're not done. You have to cultivate hope. That's what the Seder is all about. Now, it's not easy. 
it's not an easy thing. I mean, I, I read the papers in the morning like you do when I shake my head and say, what a screwed up world this is. But the Seder reminds us that we have been the recipients of miracles yesterday and God willing will be the recipients of miracles tomorrow. And that's our hope. That's, what this, that's the deepest secret of the Seder, the cultivation of hope. So let me stop here talking for almost an hour, God forbid. So let's take a moment, and I would be delighted to try and answer anyone's questions. If anyone would like to offer a question, um, not a counter sermon this evening, because there's a lot of us on, I'd like to make sure. But if you have a question, I'd be glad to try. If there's a piece of the Seder you'd like to know more about or you'd like to share, um, or if there's any other text that I can help you with, um, I'd be glad to answer anyone's questions who's got a question. All you got to do is there's a question thing at the bottom. Uh, you can put you electronically put a hand up or you can wave a hand at the screen and I'll look for you or Lana will look for you and we'll find you. Anyone have a question? They've been dying. Elise, Elise Golden Berkeley, lovely to you. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, How you feeling? You feeling better? Not much better. It's oh, been a week was, and a half. I'm so and, sorry. Uh, Bird put me on medication, so hopefully that will help. Um, and needless to say, there will be no Pesach for me. Talk about a plague. Oh, gosh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, the kids won't let me anywhere near it. Um, so when I, when I had Passover, once, you know, and I have, I don't think it's Maxwell, but I have a better one. But when it gets to the point to eat, it's far to you eat, and I'd scream out next year, Jerusalem, I don't know how to make the transition from feeding the animals who have been making animal sounds to bringing back the, uh, Haggad, the Haggadah and more cer uh, ceremony, more, more of the service. Well, how to get to the second half? Is that the question? Pretty much. Yeah, well, keep it short. I, I like to, we just sing one or two paragraphs of the Birkat Amazon. Your kids know that from camp. Right. And then we um, and then we, we open the door to Eliyahu and we do some of the readings that are in the band. And then we sing all the songs. We sing all the songs. If you've had four cups of wine, it's really not. So, by the way, the question you're asking, Elise, so that you know that you're not the first, they ask it in the Mishnah and the Talmud. The, the Talmud asks the question, what if I get to the end of the meal and I'm the only one still awake? <laughs> Can I finish the Seder? So, Elise, you are in very good company having this question. Okay, yes. let me wish you refresh. Let me should be well and get well and come back and be, a, be with us very soon. Okay, take good care. Um, David, David, is that David Spiegel, my dear friend David Spiegel, has asked the question: How did the egg get into the seder? That sounds like a joke, but I, I'm, it's a real, real question. The egg on the seder plate is a representation of a sacrifice called the Chagiga, which was the holiday sacrifice that was offered on all Jewish holidays. Okay. The egg that's in your plate that you eat, if you have that Ashkenazic custom of eating uh, boiled eggs, has to do with the rebirth of life and springtime. Okay, it's a rebirth of life and springtime um, that our ancestors, that my, my Ashkenazic ancestors uh, ate a, a boiled egg just before the, uh, as a four spice to the whole meal. And that's how I understood it um, growing up. So it's a, a, it's a symbol of the rebirth of life in the springtime. Now, here in California, you don't feel that because, you know, here in California, the temperature sometimes drops down to a frigid 67 degrees. But if you've ever lived on the East Coast or someplace in the north when it gets taka cold, you know, for a week or two or three, and then springtime comes and you can actually get outside, it really does feel like a liberation. And that's what the egg is supposed to celebrate. All right, the Kramers, I see Eileen. How are you doing? It's, uh, actually, it's both of it's us. both of us, Rabbi. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach to you too. We're wonderful. Rabbi, I have a question that I know I'm not the first to ask. Okay. Um, and my question is, is obviously, you know, the Jews left Egypt. They left, didn't have time to put leavening in their bread. They had, didn't eat leavened bread but they ate every other thing they had with them that day. <laughs> and for the next 40 years in the desert. Yeah. How is it that we can't eat anything now? I can't eat peanuts. I can't eat corn. I, you know, it's, it's gotten to the point where it's like, you know, chew on a tree branch and wait a week. 
Actually, a tree branch wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, probably got lots of fiber. All right. So there's a, a lot to that question. But l let me put the question backwards to you. I, I went to Cambridge Farms yesterday. Cambridge Farms is a kosher market over here in North Hollywood, um, because my wife and I always make pilgrimage there just to see what's kosher for Passover this year. And I have to tell you that everything is kosher for Passover this year. We found kosher for Passover Oreos, kosher for Passover cornflakes, kosher for Passover s'mores, kosher for Passover granola. You know, just I, I saw a box of kosher for Passover, kosher for Passover pancake mix. So I got to tell you that I, I said I'm standing next to this person and I said to him, if you can have pancakes, that's the end of the holiday. He said, yeah, that's true. I so, just want to know, though, have you ever tried them? Because they taste like cardboard. <laughs> well, of course they do. Of course mm, they do. They you are know. so bad. Of course they do. Look, here's the thing. Let's first talk about the intention of this, right? There's actually two parts to the holiday. Part one is the Seder that we celebrate on Friday and Saturday mm -hmm. night. Part two is a week without leavened grains. Okay. A week without leaven grains that could become leavened or leavened grains. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the meaning of this is I want to disrupt the pattern of your life. I want to turn your life upside down for a week. Why? Because for one week, I want you to be fully conscious of the narrative of your history that we were slaves in the land of Egypt, and that we found our way to freedom. You see, matzah is an interesting food, because if you read the Seder very carefully, matzah has two meanings, a positive and a negative, or negative and a positive. At the beginning of the Seder, we say, This is the bread of slaves that our ancestors ate in Egypt. Matzah is slave bread. And at the end of the Seder, we tell that story that we didn't have a time to call dominoes, so we end up eating this matzah instead, right? They didn't have time for the bread to rise. It's the bread of liberation. The point of it is to upset your life in such a way that you become acutely aware that this is a special week and that you're holding on to the narrative for this week. So that's what the purpose of this is. If you remember that purpose, you'll keep Pesach with a sort of sense of reasonableness. My suggestion is the following. <laughs> Eat natural foods, fruits and vegetables, meat and dairy, right? Fish, these things, non-processed food, natural foods are all Pesach, Dick, right? It's only when you get into grains that you get into trouble. But fruits and vegetables, meat and fish, dairy, things like that, pure foods, all Pesach, Dick. You don't have to go. go full. It's only when you start messing with the products, you know, Except that you peanuts. start getting into the, what <laughs> peanuts. So here's the peanut problem. <sighs> there is a principle <laughs> in Jewish law called siag. The principle in Jewish law means in order to keep you from violating a biblical law, we're going to extend the prohibition. I lived in New York City in the 1970s and early 1970s, right? We had a big influx of tourists from the Far East. The tourists used to fall onto the subway tracks and get whacked by subway trains. It was very bad news. Every day in the paper, you'd say, you know, this fellow from Japan, this fellow from Singapore, this poor guy from China, he was leaning over to see if the subway was coming and got whacked, right? So the brilliant geniuses that the New York Metropolitan Transit Authority painted a bright yellow line across the edge of the subway platform, and they put up a sign in English and Japanese and Chinese saying, do not cross line for your own safety. Guess what? Tourists kept getting whacked. It wasn't until someone came up with a really brilliant idea to put the line three feet back and say, do not cross the yellow line for your own safety, that people stop getting whacked on the subway stations. That's the same principle here. You are not to eat grains. There are seven grains enumerated by the Bible, okay? We have a category of food which are not grains, but sometimes look like grains. They're called legumes. Peanuts, peas, beans, lentils, this kind of thing. They're not grains because they have a higher nitrogen content, a lower starch content, lower carbohydrate content, but they look like grains. Instead of eating a barley kernel, instead of eating a, a lentil, you could eat a barley and you could mix them up. So the rabbi said, you know, don't eat these things. That took out a whole bunch of stuff from our diet, right? 
Then you get a bunch of things which are grains but are not enumerated by the Bible, like rice and corn. Corn is maize. It's a North American grass. The Bible don't know from it. And rice, the same thing. So the Sephardic rabbis were really smart. The Sephardic rabbi said, yes, rice is a grain, except one week of the year. We <laughs> hereby decree that rice is a vegetable. Why? Because <laughs> if you take rice off the plate of Sephardic Jews, they will starve to death. So the rabbis, the Sephardic rabbis are great. If you ever have a halachic question and you want to ask a very, very, very orthodox rabbi the answer, if you want the answer to be yes, ask a Sephardic rabbi. If you want the answer to be no, ask an Ashkenazic rabbi. Okay? So us Ashkenazic rabbis have taken everything off of your plate and given you nothing but cardboard to eat. So, Kramers, I wish you a wonderful week of eating cardboard. Now, Thank you, now, Rabbi. Now I, you. I do have to say, though, that I'm a really good baker. Go figure. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder I, where I that bake, came from. I bake a lot during Passover, so nobody is wanting for. No one goes food. hungry, but I like <laughs> peanut butter and jelly on matzah. You can eat peanut butter as long as it's smooth peanut butter. Really? Yes, because smooth peanut butter. The See, you can eat legumes as long as they're not in their natural condition. So crunchy peanut butter, which has chunks of peanuts in it, verboten. But smooth peanut butter is acceptable. Hallelujah. I suggest <laughs> almond butter. You're allowed to. Almonds are, are for Kershaw Pesa. Get almond butter. Trader Joe's has a very good natural almond butter. I eat a jar of it a day during Pesa. I love almond butter. So One last go. question for you, if I may. Is oat milk then kosher? No, oat milk is not because oat is a grain. It's not a legume. Okay. So even okay. if you take a grain out of its natural state, it's still hummus stick. So oat okay. milk you can't have, but almond butter you can. See, I came halfway, Scott. Give Thank you. you. you uh, give yeah, me some credit. Oat milk was for somebody else. Not give me, me some credit. Thank you. Give Thank me you, Rabbi. Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. All right, another question. Um, is the first day of Passover more important than the second? That's a really good question. The Bible says the first day and the last, it's a seven day holiday. First day and last day are the two most important days. When we moved to diaspora, we expanded the holiday to eight days and made the first two days special and the last two days special. So the answer is at least for the last 1500 years, both days are equally important, but do what you can to keep as much of the holiday as you can. Okay. And that really is my advice about everything in Jewish life. Make the hol holiday special by telling the story. And if you're going to change your life by changing your diet, make it very special. Okay. Any other questions anyone has? This is your last chance to ask a rabbi a Pesach question for free. Any other questions? I got, I, I've stumped the crowd. I can't believe this. So I'll tell you a funny story that I told the board last night, and then I'll tell you a serious story that'll help you understand the holiday. So I was at, I was at, the, I was at the, um, Cambridge Farms uh, shopping for, just looking, and, and there's a display at Cambridge Farms of shmura matzah. Now, regular matzah is matzah that's been watched by a very orthodox rabbi. Shmura matzah is like ridiculously kosher. It's they, they've watched it from the moment it was harvested to the moment it was baked, and it's baked by hand. And the shmura matzah at Cambridge Farms, if you get shmura matzah that was made in Brooklyn, it's um, shmura matzah made in Brooklyn is $25 a box, and shmura matzah made in Muncie is $28 a box, and shmura matzah made in in, 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 in even more religious neighborhoods, 30, they have Israeli shmura matzah. I'm not making this up for $45 a box. And I'm standing there looking at this. And there's a guy standing next to me in full Hasidic garb, full black coat, big black hat, pay his beard. And he picks up the box and he looks at it and he says out loud, shmura matzah, four pieces of matzah, $45, Jesus Christ. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, it's OK, brother. That's exactly what it is. It was just the most wonderful moment. <laughs> he and I had a moment together. So this is this is what this is what Pesach really is. I want you to remember this one thing, though. This is the most important part of Pesach. Um, Pesach is about telling a story and it's about telling a story of hope and it's about telling a story of hope because that is the essence of our people. And I'll tell you who taught me this. I've told this story before, but I, I want to repeat it every year because it's my Pesach story. 
I learned Pesach from my teachers and from my parents, of course, but I learned Pesach most of all from my uncle Henry. My uncle Henrik lived, um, was a Polish Jew who lived in a small village on the Polish German border. So when the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, Henry's uh, uncle Henry's village was one of the first to be taken. He was 15 years old. He had five sisters and they came to the village and they separated the family. He didn't want to leave his family. So he got in line with his father and his sisters and his father smacked them across the, the cheek and pushed him across the town square into the other line. The line with his sisters and his parents went to Auschwitz or to the concentration camps. The line that he went into went to a work camp. And Uncle Henry was a slave to the Nazis for six years. He actually was one of the guys who built Auschwitz because he was a carpenter. And he was young and he was strong and he was ridiculously lucky. And somehow six years in Nazi captivity, he stayed alive. He came out, he was, he was liberated by the American army, um, came to America, married my aunt Sylvia and became part of our family. He never spoke about his experiences ever. We knew that he was a survivor because he had numbers tattooed on his arm and because he had these strange customs. He, he bought a house in suburban New Jersey and tore down all the fences and walls. He didn't want anything to, he, he didn't want to see fences anywhere. I said, Uncle Henry, they're going to steal your barbecue. He said, let them have it. Crazy, strange man, but he never spoke about his, and we asked him all the time. He never spoke about it, never, except. One year, my aunt went back to Rutgers to get her uh, bachelor's degree, and she was taking a class in Jewish literature, and the class brought Elie Wiesel. Before he won the Nobel Prize, he was available. He came to the university to speak to my aunt's literature class, and my uncle went to hear him. And Wiesel spoke about his experiences in Auschwitz. My uncle was there at the same time, and he knew about all the events that Wiesel told. And at the end of the lecture, my uncle and aunt went down to say hello to Mr. Wiesel. And as everyone else finished, my uncle was the last one standing in the line and he started to talk to Wiesel because they knew the same people. They were there for the same moments, for the same horrors. And at the end of the evening, Ellie Wiesel turned to my uncle and said, have you told your children? And my uncle said, no, I couldn't. I don't know how. And Wiesel grabbed him by the, by the shirt collar and said to him, you must tell them, because if you don't tell them, they will never believe it really happened. So that next year, I was a student in New York City. Nina and I were studying at the seminary in New York City. We came to my aunt's house. It was oh, during the week, the week of Pesach. We came to my aunt's house for dinner one night. And after dinner, my uncle turned to the family and said, I have to tell you something tonight. So everybody sit down. And for the next three hours, he told us his story. We had never heard it before. He told us about the selection in the town square and how he ended up in the work camp line. He told us about the first camp that he went to and the second camp that he went to and the third camp that he went to. He told us about helping to build Auschwitz. He told us about the death march. They took 3,500 men from his barracks across Poland into Germany as the Russians were coming through the winter. 3,500 men left and only 700 arrived alive. He told us about being liberated, how, how small and skinny and sick he was. He told us about coming to America. And when he finished telling us those stories, we asked him, Uncle Henry, why did you never tell us before, even when we asked you? And he shook his head and he said, because you, you would never understand, because you've never known hunger, you've never known cold, you've never known want, you've never known fear like I did. I was afraid you'd never understand. And we said to him, but why are you telling us now? And he said, because Wiesel is right. If you don't hear it from me, you will not believe it happened. And from that day, Uncle Henry told everybody his story. He was part of a circuit of survivors who went to every high school in New Jersey. And I used to see him do this. It was unbelievable because he would go to high schools in inner city in Newark, in inner city neighborhoods where kids were, you know, in, with, with kids of every background. And he would tell them the story of his experience. And then he would look at him and say, I have seen the worst. I helped to build the kingdom of death. You build a kingdom of life. That's your responsibility. And I understood something from my Uncle Henry. 
because I understand how Pesach got started and what the rabbis in 71 and 72 and all those years tried to do. They, they knew that they had gone through experiences that words cannot possibly convey. But they also knew that if they didn't tell the story, then the next generation and the generation after that would never believe that it really happened. And so they gave us a format, the Seder at a meal, at a table, when a family gathers with all the love and support and kindness of a family and joy of a holiday to talk about miracles, but also to recount the evil that exists in the world and to make a pledge that we will do our part to bring redemption into the world. And just like Uncle Henry taught us that we built the kingdom of death, it's our responsibility to build the kingdom of life. That's really the ultimate meaning of the Pesach Seder. So I wish all of you a happy, healthy, and zisen Pesach, a sweet and, and wonderful Pesach, and we hope to see you when we all come back. Take good care, hug some and sh have a wonderful, wonderful holiday. Thank you, Rabbi. Hug some Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi Feinstein. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Good night.